Good afternoon. It's Charlotte Pierce. I'm the uh, producer of Ready Row USA. We are. I'm gonna I can barely hear. I'm going to guess. Ask my guests to mute their microphones until I finish this because we have uh, we have a lot of people to introduce to you. Um, Ready Row USA is a broadcast of the Rowing Chat Network. We are. Um, one of the four or five podcasts in the network, along with Faster Masters and the the uh, Coxon Coxon um, vid, uh, podcast with Whitney um, Whitney um, Preston, I think. Um, we have here are the the four podcasts, and we have wonderful show to uh, to um, bring you today the cast of a most, most beautiful thing the new documentary that that is going the rounds a lot of rowing people know about it and now a lot of uh, everybody has been on uh, reviewed on a Wall Street Journal of LA Times NPR these guys are really setting an example for the next generation of rowers, and I'm really excited to talk to them. Uh, Mona Granucci will be your host, and uh, we are going to now turn over to the podcast to Charlotte Kopp, and um, she'll read a couple of news bits. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. If you're on the East Coast, good afternoon. If you're on the West Coast, like I am, I'm Charlotte Kopp from Stationel Rowing Club in Portland, Oregon. Uh, this week, the NCAA has put out new recommendations and um, guidelines and restrictions for college athletes, uh, which is making it more healthy to participate in sport in the college, um, but also adds some complications for smaller schools. The U.S. Olympic rower Emily Reagan is back into training uh, for the Tokyo Olympics next year after she has recovered from the coronavirus. Um, Next, we have the head of the Charles 2020 is going to be a global remote event, so you can do it on your home course, so everyone around the world will have more access to that. And last, Anita de France is the first vice president of the International Olympic Committee uh, 40 years after the Moscow boycott. So it's great to have a strong woman in the International Olympic Committee. Okay, next, Mona. Let's hear it. Oh, thank you, Charlotte. And I just wanted to introduce Charlotte Cop because she has a wonderful name, but she's also <laughs> our in our intern and uh, she does our social media. She's really an asset to the podcast. So thank you very much for Thank you. For Good to be here. Charlotte. I'm very excited. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, will introduce Mona Granucci and the guys from the cast of A Most Beautiful Thing, one of my favorite movies of all time. So I've been unmuted. So it's really great to be here with you guys. I'm super excited about this as you um, may not know, but I, I did read the book and um, also was able to watch the documentary last week. And I really thought that I, I was really inspired. I, I wrote around the same time you guys did. I wrote in college and, and I hear the baby's gotten getting fed. I, I really did appreciate um, sort of the story. Uh, you know, I came from South Memphis and we didn't have rowing. Um, it wasn't a, a, something that was available to us. And I thought that this was some type, you know, really fantastic program um, that Ken was able to create and introduce to you. Oh, Ken, and you, you were able to join. So nice to see you. Um, so I, I did actually have a question for you to get started. I, you know, why did you think it was important to introduce rowing to Manly? You there? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I do, Ken. Ken, I'm here. What's up, guys? Hi. Hello. Um, I wanted to talk to you and ask why you thought this program was important to create and why did you think it was important to introduce rowing to Manly? Can you guys hear me? 
We yeah. can. Yeah. I had a little, uh, I had a little phone problem, so I had, to, I had to go into my car to charge my phone. Understood. She asked you a question, kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask yeah. about your phone. <laughs> I seen, I seen it. He just came unmuted, though. It shows the He's unmuted. All right. So you can ask him again, Mono. Sorry. All right. So why did you think it was important to introduce rowing to Manly? <laughs> Chad. Chad, can you hear? I can. All right. Uh, Ken, so, she, so, Ken, she said, why do you think it was important to introduce um, rowing to Manly? Um, you know, I mean, I think it's a sport that, you know, obviously a 99% a white person sport, and I thought that a family could really benefit from uh, being introduced to that sport. You know, basketball and some other sports kind of dominated, and you know, I don't know, basketball on a sport. Also, a, a pathway to college, a different kind of world, and, uh, Mm -hmm. You know, talked to our Shay and Malcolm and uh, Alvin and Preston and some of the guys. It, it wasn't. Ken, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. So if you get to a better spot for a reception or something. Um, okay. Are you going to hear? Okay. Okay. So I'll, um, I'll change up the next question a little bit just so, so anyone can answer. But I will say that, you know, when I rode in college, my coach always said there's no professional rowing. And I thought it was great that this entrepreneurship um, was built into the program. Uh, and it seemed like it almost had equal importance. Why was it and why do you feel like it was important to incorporate this into the rowing program at Manly? Who are you asking? Anyone who wants to answer. You can raise your hand or. We got the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think just entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurship is, you know, in our neighborhood, you know, a lot of folks work for people, right? And I think, it, you know, everyone wanted to start their own business. We always mm -hmm. wanted to figure out how can we make money? You know, people mm -hmm. couldn't, didn't join teams because they had to work. They wanted to know how to make, they wanted to make money, you know? And right. for some people, the option was to go out and sell drugs. So, you know, Ken deciding to say it's an entrepreneurship program and not just academic support was amazing. Mm -hmm. because what mm -hmm. academic, I mean, what entrepreneurship teaches you is the lessons that last for a long time. All these guys own their business now because they always wanted to. They just needed the first step on how to do that. And and that was uh, that that was important. So when you in those classes, you learn about the market. You mm -hmm. you you learn how to save money, how to shake a hand, how to network, understand mm -hmm. what resources. Um, that are needed in that community and how to go get it and 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 create it for your community. Uh, so entrepreneurship uh, dives deep into the community work, and so I thought that's why that was that was super important. Okay, that was great. Thank you. So so tell tell us about the brotherhood or the fraternity that was created by this shared experience. No. Charlie, can you unmute Malcolm? Hey, unmute. Tell me to unmute his mic. I can't because he muted himself. Uh, so. I'll mute Malcolm. Can you guys? Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can, can hear you hear now, Ken. We right. can hear you now. Hey guys. Hi. <laughs> Malcolm, unmute. All right, unmute. Preston, you want to talk about the brother of Preston? So Malcolm, figure out how to unmute. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I got it. Um, the, bro the brotherhood between all was developed during uh well actually before and during our experience with the crew team man like i spoke about it earlier you know we just we hung out a lot spent a lot of time on and off the boat so you know it was more so like a like you said a brotherhood a family instead of just being friends mm -hmm. we all developed close personal bonds amongst each other and then you know the same as when we was inside the boat we all developed a bond that was really tight and connected really well yeah. Okay. And just to add to that, I think, too, just, uh, you know, we all in the same boat when it comes to just being unfamiliar with the sport. Right. So we all were open. We came with a sense of openness. And, you know, when we was pushed out into water, you know, it, you know, we had to be tough at school. So for some of us, the, it was the first time we saw fear in each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And then survival mode kick in when fear is there. Right. And it tells you to get back to this dock safely. We have to pull together. 
right? Mm -hmm. And that's and that was the first um, the first time we really was on the same page is understand that we got to get back to the dock safely. And from there, mm -hmm. a, a lot of other lessons are learned, right? Mm -hmm. To learning to follow each other, learning to trust, um, learning to listen, right, to each other, and 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 and, and developing that chemistry in the boat, then outside of the boat. Uh, to move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what did you learn about yourself in this program? And anyone can answer this. You too can. You too can. <laughs> oh, you want to talk about the brotherhood? No, no. What did you learn about yourself um, starting this program? Um, wow. Where do I, where do I begin? Um, <laughs> I, I learned that, like, you know, you can't take you can't take people trusting you for granted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I started working with Arche and, and the other guys on the team, you know, it took a lot for them to trust me. And, you know, I learned that that, that you had to go into a situation that, that was unfamiliar to you with, with a lot more humility than I was used to going into situations. You know, mm -hmm. I, I learned, you know, I learned a whole new way of looking at the world because, you know, as a white person, as a white middle class person growing up in suburban America, you know, it was a different, you know, a lot of different assumptions about how I grew up. And then when I started working with, uh, you know, closely in the North Lawndale community with uh, with teenagers, especially, you know, I learned I learned a lot about, you know, what, you know, how they view the world and how how, you know, our Shay and his friends and, you know, the, the other the other kids in the, in the entrepreneurship program program, you know, viewed, you know, what their life was going to look like and the opportunities they had in front of them. So mm -hmm. you know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the world and about the different communities people grew up in. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I think I was just learned a lot. It's just like how to just be patient, right? And, and again, trust, right? And not judge. You know, I, I came with a lot of judgment, right? Uh, who Alvin is, who, who Malcolm is, right? And and you know, and so I think getting to know these guys helped me not to judge, to walk them out in their shoes as well. And so you know, and and so just like how to be patient, judge, and and overcoming fear is the biggest thing, right? Like getting over that fear of the water, the fear of travel, the fear of hanging out with people I don't normally hang out with. Uh, I found hope in a future on the other side of that fear and a brotherhood on the other side of that fear. And sometimes, you know, people didn't come back because of that fear. They, you know, they, they didn't give it a, a second chance. And so when you can stick it out and fight through that fear, right. And, and, and step out on faith uh, on the other side is, is great things waiting for you. I think we have Malcolm back. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm, what did you learn about yourself in the program? Oh, wow. I, I learned that, um, you know, I had to trust people. I definitely learned that um, life just didn't consist of me being on the west side of Chicago and, you know, dealing with the, the issues that I dealt with growing up. So, you know, like in the documentary, they talked about my father and me growing up in a, you know, somewhat of a, I don't want to say racist. I don't think my father was like racist. He was definitely, you know, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for? Mean? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, he was a tough guy. Kind of Florida, he, was man. A, he was a fierce, proud black man. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But uh, you know, I learned that um, you know, all white people wouldn't mean. You know, I was you know taught that at home every day. Woke up to you know, if they don't look like you, they not you. They gonna be mean to you. You know, look out for your own. You know, but you know, I got around Ken. I got around a lot of the other guys, and, and you know, I learned that you know these guys were my brothers just as well as. <laughs> You know, my brothers at home, they are definitely taught me more than my brothers at home. So I learned a lot from, you know, just being around people that, that I wasn't used to being around. You know? What about you, Preston? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Same thing. I learned a lot being in the program. Uh, like they just said, trust and, and being able to push through. Rowan and this whole experience just taught me, like, being able to stay focused and 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 focus in on what what the task at hand, pretty much I can accomplish anything. You know, these guys taught me a lot. Ken taught me a lot. It's just about trust and being able to stay focused to see everything through. Thank you, Preston. Are you the one who has the um, 
the hair business. Barbershop. Yeah. The hair business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Is that what they call them now? I don't yeah. know. I don't, but it was like a lavish cuts or something, right? Yeah, la yeah lavish cuts. Yeah, lavish cuts. Uh, I love it. I follow you on Instagram. She was going to ask you, can you cut Ken's hair? Let's sure. <laughs> yeah, see that fro over there. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a mohawk. Man. My hair was right. so long before I cut a cut. <laughs> yeah, your, your hair getting real long, Ken. Do <laughs> <laughs> me, man. It's a, hey, it's a good. It's a good look. <laughs> All right, I haven't heard from Alvin. What did you learn about yourself? <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> she you, what did you learn about yourself on the in a, in a growing program? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? I'll oh, take you the hear. headphones off. Oh, the headphones. Yeah, you can take the headphones off. Take, we, can't can't hear hear we, we, can't, we can't hear him, though. We, we can't, can't hear we can't him, hear but, but he might be going through... Uh, his, you know, his uh, Apple, whatever AirPods or whatever. I don't know. Those aren't AirPods. No. Maybe they are. I, I would, know. I, I wouldn't know. I don't either. <laughs> so, hey, Alvin, might, I'll check with you. Like, uh, like me and Malcolm did, log out and log back in, because I couldn't hear it first. Yeah. I see Malcolm logged out and log back in, and he can hear. Yeah. The other thing you can do is go to the little gear at the bottom, and you might have to choose a different microphone. Oh, okay. Let me, ch uh, let me, uh, we'll go why don't we move on and we'll check back with you. Okay. Okay. So moving from the nineties to the present, um, or at least within the last couple of years, I noticed that you are Shay in the film. You, you said something to the effect when you were talking about the Chicago police and, and rowing with them that you would change minds one at a time. I, I can tell you this was, you know, or something to that effect, like, you know, like, you know, you can't be influential if you're not changing people's hearts and minds. Tell me a little bit about that, because, you know, your spirit and enthusiasm and willingness to do this is pretty powerful. And um, sometimes you wonder if, if one at a time is enough. Um, obviously, I think the we'll probably see more about this now that we're in a national movement. But I wanted to hear from you about what that means to you. Yeah, I mean, obviously the relationship is, it, there's no relationship, right? It's a lot of mistreatment and neglect in the community. And, um, you know, and it, it, and also the community has a lot of things that need to be fixed that um, that's a result to, of, of, of redlining and Jim Crow laws, right? And, you know, for me, I, I'm that person that, you know, at the end of the day, when we wake up tomorrow morning, although this is movement, the immediate response is that our kids still live in a neighborhood, our guys still live in a neighborhood. Anybody we can start a relationship with to get them to understand where we come from right away, let's do it, right? Mm -hmm. And we was in a unique position, mm -hmm. you know, as a teacher, you forget some of your students, but as a student, you never forget your teacher. So we had an opportunity to be the teacher, mm -hmm. right? And we not only rode with them, but we talked about the lessons that we learned outside of the boat, right? Teamwork, trust, understanding. And the whole goal was really to get them to understand that it takes a village to raise a child and that needs to be, and, and they need to play their part, right? And that's to serve and that's to, to protect. And, mm -hmm. and, and to do that, you have to know the people in your community. You, you know, whenever, um, you know, when it comes to like Breonna Taylor or, uh, Elijah McClain, when we when a, a, a unarmed black American is 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 murdered by a cop, everyone would say, you know, say their names. And I thought to myself a year ago when I decided to invite them out to row, it's like, what if they knew our names, right? Just what if you just you know our names? And so that's why I invited them out, and we rowed together. We you know we took them to the same water that. Uh, we where we started and where we didn't get along at first and they heard our stories and you know they walked them out in our shoes and you know I said in the film that it doesn't change the system it's going to take a long time to change that system mm -hmm. but to start a conversation about who we are and who our kids are and 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 and, and what we do and how we contribute to our community was important to let them know because who knows where they will hit who else they're going to hit it from 
And so I thought it was important that they hear from us. I just thought that one of the most powerful scenes in the movie for me was um, when you were working with your own kids, you know, it was so, it was really moving. Yeah, and, and, and they were there to watch that. And that was yes. so important that they saw these guys working with their kids and how the kids were so in, in tune with their dads and the yes. importance of fatherhood and, 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 and that relationship. And those things are just a small fraction of what's happening on the West Side that the media don't show. And mm -hmm. it was important to give them that experience. Yeah, really magical connection. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So I don't know if anyone else wants to speak, but the next question I have is how does the film fit into where we are right now as a nation? We kind of went into that a little bit, but I'd like to hear anyone else's perspective as to where we are now. Um, I know Mary quoted on it before I had said it like in a time in a time of uh of need, it's a it's a much needed film right now. We're going through a lot in uh in today's society, man. And the film is something that's like inspirational motivational, educational, and it's something everybody can relate to, whether white, black, regardless of whatever uh, race or creed you are, something that you can be familiar with, something that you can jump on board with and be proud to say, hey, I'm a part of this, or I'm a pr proud to even know people that's a part of this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Kenny? Okay. I think we have Malcolm back. Ken uh, Alvin. Elvin, I'm sorry. Arshay, what was the question? How does what's happening in the world today in our nation fit into the film? And it couldn't be, it couldn't be more relevant. I mean, it's perfect. Um, you know, it's been incredibly frustrating for me for for twenty years for you know, kind of you know worlds and having friends just not really open their eyes to the reality but you know our african brothers on the west side of chicago and other america what their experience is like and and how it really is different and like you know people say you know everyone has the same opportunity bootstraps 20 years and i've had a difficult time you know people that you know the white experience than the black experience and white privilege is real and people you know, don't really accept that and I think we are having a little trouble hearing you Ken again so I'm sorry we're not, we're getting about 50 percent of what you're <laughs> saying but we have a question are any of your kids gonna row that's one of my questions too yeah did you inspire any rowers little rowers yeah actually uh my daughter's very interested um when we was in the, when we was in the tanks, mm -hmm. the the coaches they actually said that she had a very good technique. She was kind of a natural. So uh, the CTC program offered her uh, a summer program where she could come to the to the facility and work out, yes. and they and they would do the same thing they did with us, kind of train them in rowing and and help them prepare to try to be filling out for college applications and maybe uh, go to a school to actually row. Mm -hmm. How old is she? Oh, she just turned 16. My daughter's very interested. Very cool. And so is my son. He's a, a basketball player. He played for an AAU basketball team on the west side of Chicago. But um, I've definitely incorporated uh, rowing into our workout. So whenever me and him go out and work out, it's mostly rowing, ergging, um, squats, jogging, you know, some of the same things that we did, you know, growing up at Manly. So I'm hoping that he pick up the sport of rowing. Right now, he's kind of infatuated with basketball, but he definitely like he loves the sport. He like we're watching me, you know, row, and he, you know, figure one day he'd be, you know, doing the same thing. What do they think about all this? Your kids think about all the hoopla about the movie. Sasha don't care right now. She's nine months. <laughs> <laughs> what a sixteen-year-old's gonna have an opinion. Hey, Alvin, how, how Makaya feel about the film? Man, she really loved the film. She actually sent it to. Um, she emailed it to, well, the you know the trailer and everything to a few of her teachers, a bunch of her friends. She's trying to get everybody on board to watch it. Um, she's really interested in Ruin too. 
she begged me so many times to take it to um, over there, but I couldn't because I was working a lot. So uh, I couldn't, we couldn't get it right, but hopefully this is our senior year. So hopefully everything can get back to somewhat normal where she can go and, you know, work out, get on the water and hopefully roll through college. Cool. That'd be great. I would have loved some company. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see the next question. So one of the next things I said is there's really nothing more unifying when you're in a boat, when you're all in unison, you hear only the oar locks and the water and you're breathing. Mm. What was it like when you found that rhythm with the members of the Chicago Police Department, that moment? <laughs> I know it didn't happen quickly. <laughs> <laughs> like, was it really as awkward as it looked? <laughs> no, I, no, I have to say, no, I have to say that, you know, uh, they didn't show up in a lot. We tried to get them to show up in a lot of practices, man. It was hard getting those guys together. They didn't show up. No, oh, <laughs> they <didn't> show up. <laughs> they, they, they was there physically. Hey, so look, <laughs> they, and look, they made it look a lot easier than it was in the movie than it was yeah. to actually work with those guys. I mean, but to be honest, a lot of those guys had never been on the water before, had never rowed at all. So I mean, to get them in there, to get them in the water in the boat with us, it actually came out pretty good. They mm -hmm. caught on pretty quick when they were there, and uh. Like you said, to be able to race with them in it during the film for the filming, it actually was pretty cool. It was something, like you said, inspiring and just to come together because it's mm -hmm. something that we don't do in Chicago. Yeah. We call them 12 in Chicago. Black people and, and 12 don't get along. That well. So <laughs> it's like to be able to put us all in one boat concurrently and, and working together, it, it was pretty nice. It was a good experience. I also have to credit Mike Tatey for getting us moving in our first experience. You know, as an Olympic coach, he came in and, I mean, he really wrote, you know, just worked with magic and getting us to to move together the first time in an eight. It was just, it, he, you know, great coach and uh, made it, made it, you know, just really simplify things for them uh, to get us moving and, and building that connection. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being frank about that. <laughs> so, um, so what was, the, I think you kind of answered the second part of the question. One of, uh, we already talked about that. Um, the next generation of black rowers, how are we going to get more people in our communities interested in the sport of rowing? I used to be the recruiter for my coach. Um, and I was often challenged by trying to recruit people from the admission line. I was, it was a club sport at my college and I recruited one guy just because he was big and tall and he ended up getting gold in the Olympics. But um, for, for the most part, it was really hard for me to get our black and brown colleagues to get out there on the water. Rob, we're going to be more hands-on now. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, with us, once they see our story, once they see the film, I think people will want to give it a shot. Yeah. You know, they see they see the, our backgrounds. We come from different gangs, different neighborhoods, you know, and we were able to come together. And now we, we love each other, you know, as if we had the same mother and father, you know? Yeah. So I think that's what's going to, I think that's going to help bring more color to the ruin. <laughs> Sounds I good agree. to me. I, I agree. Hey, I got a question at the mm -hmm. bottom of the screen. Um, I'm seeing like an inbox and questions are popping up. Are we supposed to answer that? How does that work? No, it's uh, that's kind of like a private chat, but okay, the questions are coming in from uh Facebook and LinkedIn okay. and YouTube. So, like, I, I see this one, Nancy Mack, she's actually a friend of mine. Um, she's posted this on the Facebook page, so yeah. okay. Okay. But, you know. but uh, Charlotte Cop had a question that she did put in the private chat. Have you seen your children become empowered or change with rowing? I've seen that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, did you want to? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I guess I can chime in. Uh, yeah, like I said, my daughter definitely is. She, is she has a new outlook for mm -hmm. uh, the sport. She wasn't too aware of it when I was doing it. So to be able to be there filming and actually experience uh 
a little bit of the rowing. She's definitely changed her mindset and the way she sees and think and views things. And she definitely wants to be a part of uh of the new of the new rowing experience. I'm on with that. Ooh, what's that sound? I don't know, but it got me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um so tell us about your current work and the your role in the community. Oh yeah. got it, Ryan. I got it. Uh, uh so the, you go first. We <laughs> talked about it earlier. Um, so actually right now I've teamed up with uh my church, New Beginnings Church, Pastor mm -hmm. Corey Brooks. Mm -hmm. So every every year we do a, a barber give back where me and a couple of my colleagues that I work with in the shop, we all go back and volunteer and we uh we cut all the children's hair in the community to get ready to go back to school. We also give out school supplies, book bags, we have a big barbecue. All the kids come out, the families come out. It's just a big celebration every year. Very cool. And you, is it Alvin? Or I'm sorry, who was? Um, yeah, Alvin. Well, yes, I have, a, um, I have a moving company and I go back, you know, I reach out to the young guys around the neighborhood and mm -hmm. anyone who want to, you know, come work, make some money on the weekend or through the week. Or whatever i pretty much you know i give them a job so um i mean so many of them um worked for me before so many i get so many calls but i don't have enough work and it's a labor only um right now i just do provide labor only services so i don't have a truck but once um once i'm able to get my truck and everything like that then i can provide more jobs for the guys who want to work because it's a ton of guys who want to work but they you know they're caught up in the street they, they're caught up in our neighborhood the streets like mm -hmm. so um when i'm able to bring those guys in you know we'll see what happens you know these i these thought that was smart <laughs> these guys are smart and they don't they don't really want the streets mm -hmm. they just feel like it's nothing mm -hmm. nothing else available right it was so cool when you said, you know, I never saw myself as someone who would be hiring people, you know, <laughs> in charge of a, <laughs> of a company, you know. Why is there, there, laughing? And there, there you are. Because <laughs> because those were Malcolm's words. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was Malcolm. <laughs> now it all comes out. It's all <laughs> but, you know, we definitely got to. We definitely just got to give big thanks to Arche because he brought life back to this story. You know, we can, you know, um, he started it and we, I mean, it was just, we're friends for life. We didn't think nothing else of it, but Arche brought the story back to life and mm -hmm. give big ups to him, big ups to um, Ken and Jessica and Victor. You know, they, they really worked, they really worked as a mark. He really worked as to you know, to get us in shape to be able to compete. So big up to those guys. Mm. Are you? Do you plan on competing again? <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. The guys know I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah, I'm ready. Because I'm volunteering to be in your boat if you want to do head of the park. Y'all got to catch me for the next two years, man. I'm getting too old. <laughs> After forty, I think I'm done. <laughs> hey, uh, Preston, I oh, man, we stay we stay young on the herb machine. <laughs> I'm still using now, so I started uh, seven, eight years ago, and I'm 64 now. So, are you still going strong? Good. Yeah, I'm sculling. I look yeah. motiv motivation. Right there, there you go. I had a rowing coach I'm, that was in the 80s, so I think you can. Yeah, have... <laughs> I row yeah. with women that are in their 80s and 70s. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. I do. It's really yeah, great. So we, put me in that boat. <laughs> hey, put, me in, put me in that boat. They're right. really fast. Those are fast old ladies. I'm sorry. Yeah. Fast I bet. old ladies. <laughs> I bet they are. <laughs> so um, the last question I had for you was to tell me a little bit about the Most Beautiful Thing Fund. I was reading about it from the Pocock Foundation and what that fund aims to achieve and how our listeners and, and folks could contribute. Yeah, it's a fund that with the same idea of starting a program like Ken did over 20 years ago, like where, where does the cities, the neighborhoods that can benefit from rowing, that's mostly everywhere. And 
especially every inner city in, in our country. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the important parts of the film to me is when Pooh said that when they tore down the YMCA, I ran to the street, right? And there was 150 kids out there just hanging out with nothing to do. And I think what that fund do is, is, is put rowing in those cities or in those communities that, that need the sport, right? And, and help with the programs that already exist with better equipment, better coaches, academic support, and maybe like an entrepreneurship program that's been so beneficial in, in our lives. Um, and, and hopefully, man, the goal is really get kids in college, right? And to use the film, the story, to just inspire. You know, these guys went out there and they were just so honest. They were so open, and I think they understood that it's important for this generation to, to number one, understand that it's okay to, to tell your story. It's okay to talk to someone about what you go through. And, um, and so that's, that's what it's all about, the gift of storytelling, the gift of bringing stories to the world, and, and hopefully everyone will be inspired by it, you know, and, and it, 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 it takes a lot, and I appreciate all of these guys, you know, and what they brought to the table. I mean, we had a, we had a good time, man, just growing up. And I mean, you, you go to a restaurant, or you, or you go to a city, and you come back and you tell everybody, man, you gotta go there, you gotta try it out, right? It, it'd be selfish of us to not want to share the sport with other people, and you know, and so I think collectively. Um, we came together to do that. And it takes a village to raise a child. We needed Pan Alpart. We needed a Victor. We needed a Jessica. We needed a Eugene. We needed Victory Outreach. We needed a high school, right? And so that's the story is how do we get the village together to move forward and, and, and do the work, right? You can't, the biggest lesson I learned in Rowan is that you can't do the work of eight people, but you need eight people to do the work and you'll get there much faster. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we can get everybody a, uh, a part of this this fun or just do the work in their community and invite someone out to row and, and give opportunities to those who need it. And uh, Nancy had another question. Has your story inspired any other community stories to come forward and be told? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I received so many messages now that people are seeing our story and they're, they're actually coming. Um, They'll call, they'll call me or text or whatever, and they start talking about, you know, things that happened when they were growing up. So now people are really starting to open open up more. Mm -hmm. And in the film, my sister said it has to be talked about in order to heal. Now these people who never said anything, seeing me break down in tears, you know, seeing everyone's um, struggles, now they're starting to talk to people and ask questions and now they're starting to heal. So, definitely. I think Elliot got a story to tell. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, it falls. <laughs> <laughs> and I think too it's just like everyone that I mean I think collectively we we from the same neighborhood but we're so different. The message I got is people who related to Alvin was like, man, dude, like I know that life. And I also had a lot of um, white people who grew up very privileged, who were inspired, was inspired by what Ken did. And it was like, oh, he did it. I have resources, I should do it, right? Um, you know, and I think just like, there's so many different stories from not only us, not only the coaches and mentors, but from my moms too. There's so many moms, it's just like, oh my God, like I love the mom story in this film. And um, yeah, so it, it's it's inspiring so many people to tell their story. We look forward to and more of them. Changing a few people, like perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I received um, a message, a phone call actually, and he, you know, he started. He said, "Well, he started to talk about his past and his views of blacks and you know people from where we're from," and he started. When he said, man, because of the film, he's starting to think differently. I guess he was judged. I don't really know, but in so many words, he judged people because of where they come, where they came from or whatever, where they were from. So mm -hmm. he's starting to see things clearly now and differently. One person at a time, I guess. 
Ken, how does it sound? He's gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think he went. He went under the tunnel or something. We have another question, Mona. Do you want to take that one? Sure. It says, how do you all get back to training regularly for the reunion race? I'm curious how you balance rowing training and other responsibilities. Look at the head. Oh my gosh. I'll no, that training was good. You see those bodies transfer so fast, like Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> But Malcolm went from that the airplane scene where he said Mike Tatey to like that. <laughs> that was a huge transformation, man. Like I, you know, even though like Alvin roasted us in the beginning, it, uh, but I think the transformation for myself was just it was insane. It was great, and it felt good. And we, you know, just to have each other, and you know, I think you know we definitely worked ourselves more than we would have because we understood that. You know, because we all have our personal life, our own business, and stuff like that. But we understood that this was, was not just for us, but we were kind of like doing this for the, the the world in a way. So I think that kept us on track. It was really difficult, you know, for me especially. I was um, because I'm a mover, so I have to go. I move furniture all day, and in between, I go um, sometimes do a ten thousand meter piece and pieces throughout the day. So I really worked and worked to make sure I could get down the course, you know. <laughs> but it was it was it was, it was rough. And then in between that I had I had to have um surgery. So that put me out for like nearly a month with no training. So man, it was rough getting back, but it worked out. Well it's like and, getting back. <laughs> and how's your sound? <laughs> this sounds so much better. Yeah, kick me to the curb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you kicked him out? Oh, we hear him now. We hear you now. I did oh, not kick him out. out. I did not kick him out. We have another question but from Charlotte. Yeah. Okay. So, what advice do you have for other young rowers and non-rowers of color? <laughs> Rower, yeah. What, what advice do you have for other young rowers and non-rowers of color? I guess she means athletes in general. Or yeah, athletes in general. Focused. People yeah. that don't row. Definitely yeah, stay focused. Stay, stay well, focused. Yeah. yeah, well, I think Malcolm would say drink pink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Get your phone. Get your phone. That beet juice? <laughs> no, I definitely tell them, man, it's more than, you know, just basketball, baseball, and football, you know, nothing against those sports. But, you know, most of my opportunities came from rowing. Most of my, you know, the knowledge, of, you know, that I apply to this day came from rowing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of kids look at basketball and football and some of those sports that, you know, might take them somewhere. But I think that if they just gave rowing a try, you know, they will see that the opportunities that there were a lot, there were a lot more opportunities in, in throwing than it was, you know, basketball or football or baseball. So just give it a try, you know, get out there, do the work, and, you know, enjoy doing it. And, you know, trust me, you know, you, you, you definitely, re, you know, rewards will, will follow. It's an addictive yeah. sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also say put the time in, not only, you know, sometimes we spend so many hours beating on our our, our our body in the sport, but like, you know, put a lot of time to train yourself mentally. That mental toughness is so important. That's you going on YouTube and listening to motivational speeches. There's, there are many books out there on mental toughness. That's, um, you know, being open and honest about where you're at with, with your coach so he can you know, give you the advice and the strength you need mentally to to carry on, but make sure you put in the same amount of hours mentally to to your training. Mm -hmm. I think that helps. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Well, let's do this again. Is, is did you want to have any other? Uh, did you have any other questions for for them, Mona? I don't have any other questions. I just wanted to thank you guys for, for sharing your story. I thank the, the rowing community and for um, us black rowers who have not seen other folks like you in our in our in our narratives. So I, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you and um, let's keep keep it going and make sure our kids and their friends all get out there and learn this beautiful sport. And come to Boston in a row. Oh yeah. Love too. 
No, okay. we'll be, I'll, 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 be, I'll, be, I'll be your two seat. I'll show, yeah. I'll, I'll show you how to get to the bridges on the Charles River. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's Charlotte, as long as you got those Celtics tickets, we'll be there. Definitely. <laughs> I'll do right. what I can that's do. That's what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> you can get that out. I can get you a ticket to the head of the Charles. The head of the Charles. <laughs> yeah. I think that's free, but okay. <laughs> anyway, you have some famous people that you worked with. There, got a little slide up there, and also wanted to mention Mary Mazio, who I met a couple of years ago. And, Mary was um, great, man. Mary has been awesome through the whole film, man. She's just like a, uh, she's a workhorse. I guarantee you, if we didn't have her as a director. We would have got away with a lot of stuff in practice. <laughs> we would have been like, no, we only had to do it one time. We good. You know what I mean? If you didn't know Rowan, we would have got away with a lot of stuff. She had us out there in the cold. Uh, <laughs> just do it again. That was the that I, 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 that's the only language I thought she knew. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> do it again. I heard she had Mike Tatey well in hand too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We really appreciate you guys coming on, and, and thanks again. Let's do it again. Thank right, you so much. Right. I hope thank, you can come thanks back. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you, you guys for all showing up. I'd like to uh, just uh, bring us out here with a, a nod to our sponsors, because we are really appreciate um, these people who keep us on the air, which are this our sponsors. Um, we have a sponsor this month, NK Speed Coach uh, Summer Regatta um, Series. You can race on the water and your speed coach, you guys know what a speed coach is. Um, it will feed the information up and you can actually race with people, uh, even though we can't do it at regattas this year. Um, we are Rowing Chat is also uh, putting together a page a program to help rowing retailers recover. So a lot of people are just devastated. Their businesses are devastated by the uh, pandemic shutdown and the shutdown of the regattas. They're just, it's just really a uh, desperate need. So we're going to put together the, the a retailers page. And if you have a suggestion, please email us via rowing chat and we also have a survey. You can find that at rowing.chat slash sponsors. Um, you can connect with us on YouTube or Facebook. And we'd love to hear uh, suggestions for episodes and guests that we should have on, especially now that we can't cover the regattas. Um, we'd like to do some more explorations like we did today with, with the cast of uh, the a most beautiful thing movie and i think that came along at a really good time because because we're we're watching the movie and we can't row but um our hashtag is ready row usa uh you can use the hashtag on social media and win gadgets and gear um, and services we have a club news if you have a rowing club that you'd like to uh give us the news about it we will feature that every couple of months we do a roundup of the club news and we also have our gadgets and gear forum i'm a kind of a gadget freak so i started this little series on the podcast and um, i i just love to find new gadgets so please send them along we will feature them and maybe have you on to discuss what you like about them and how they help you rowing um anyway my my company is pierce press uh, i'd like to announced that we won a uh, Purple Dragonfly Award for our latest children's book, Who's Hiding in This Book? And it's also a, has a message of diversity. Um, our correspondent, Kimberly Reynolds of Recovery on Water. She lives in Chicago and she's kind of on break right now, but she's, she's um, doing a lot of stuff for Recovery on Water, which is breast cancer survivor rowing. Uh, organization. Charlotte Kopp out at Station L, which is the coolest name for a rowing club. And she coaches at, Charlotte, where do you coach at? Uh, Pacific University or I can't, I, I think maybe she might be gone. Anyway, um, it's really nice to have her with us. We have upcoming episodes on clubs, boat buying, Olympic previews and updates and gadgets and gear, as I mentioned. 
and we are going to end the broadcast. Of course, we went late, but we are so happy to have you guys on. And uh, thank you so much. I'm going to unmute you so that you can say goodbye. And thanks again, Hi, everybody. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks for having us. We thank really you. enjoyed it. Thank yeah, let's do it again. Bye. <laughs>